Здравствуйте. Сегодня не мой первый день в университете МГУ. I came here 47 years ago as a student. I loved Russia then, I still love Russia. So I'm back after a long distance, a long delay. Lucha pozhda chum nikagda. Vice Rector Kakov, Dean Kachuk, distinguished faculty, Adam, Steve, sponsors of the lecture, distinguished faculty, students, friends. It's so nice to be here. I'm going to use this opportunity to talk about the Aquaphor and water channels, but I also hope to use this to reignite the issue of international friendships. Science brings people together, and as scientific colleagues, we become friends and have a special role. So the title of my talk, Aquaphor and water channels, from atomic structure to clinical medicine. And special thanks to Nobel Media, Adam, and AstraZeneca, Steve, for organizing this opportunity. I'm not a very good photographer, but when I was a high school student traveling through Russia, I took some pictures. I've been here before. Here's our group camping. I'm, no, I'm the photographer, I'm not in the picture. We were all teenagers. The gentleman sitting, my high school German teacher, organized it. He was the grand old man. He was 25 years old. We had a fantastic time in Russia. We entered from Finland, Viborg, to Leningrad, Moscow, South Oryol, Kursk, Kharkov, Pichyagorsk, or Janakitsa, all the way to Tbilisi. This was our interest guide, Nadja Mukhina. Nadja, if you're out there anywhere, I'd love to see you again. We camped in interest campgrounds with real Russians, probably the parents, grandparents of the students that are here today. Russia was a little different in 1966. Just two decades after the Great War, still recovering. This was the main highway south of Moscow. Where are the cars? There are two trucks. There's a motorcycle. It's changed a lot. But the spirit of the Russian people has not changed at all. It's immensely welcoming, encouraging, enthusiastic. Here is our Volkswagen bus. A young couple were so enamored they wanted their photograph taken in front of the Volkswagen Kombi wagon. And we stopped at villages. The villagers all came in to see this wonderful machine, this wonderful Volkswagen bus. Horoshoya <laughs> machine. And this is a picture of me in the, off the Georgian military highway en route from Orjanakidze to, to Bilisi. It was a great adventure. I'm so glad to be back in your country. So the issue that I'll discuss scientifically is the water channels. As our dean mentioned in the introduction, our bodies are primarily water. Two-thirds of our body mass is water. This is shared amongst all life forms. It was Albert Senjorgi who received the Nobel Prize for his work on vitamin C. But he's remembered for having once said, water, the solvent of life. Without water, there's no life. For a moment, think now. Our bodies are two-thirds water mass. Is it randomly distributed? And the answer is, of course, no. During this hour while I'm speaking, we'll each be secreting and reabsorbing cerebrospinal fluids to bathe the surface of our brain. We'll be filling the orbits of our eyes with aqueous humor, protecting the surface of our eyes with a thin film of tear. Those of us who've just had something to eat will be salivating. Some of us, me in particular, will be sweating, humidifying our airways, concentrating our urine, a large volume of primary urine, 
a small volume of final urine. And if you don't think that's important, next time you're on a long airplane flight in the economy section and the seat belt light goes on, think about aquaporin too. It'll make perfect sense. So the issue in terms of biology of water is how does water cross barriers? How does water cross the plasma membrane? Long before our work started, other biophysicists had considered the problem of transmembrane water permeability. And it was concluded correctly with the discovery of the lipid bilayer, the outer membrane of the cell, flexible, semi-permeable to water, that diffusion will allow water to enter and leave cells. But this was not enough to explain rapid movement of water through renal tubules through the membranes of secretory glands and red blood cells. It was understood by this pioneering group of biophysicists that these membranes had a very high capacity for water permeation and very selective for water. And the movement was created by osmotic gradients. Osmosis, this process that we all learned about as small, small school children. Rapid osmosis occurred, but how? So in 1970, the year I began my university studies, an important experiment was done at the University of California, Berkeley, by Bob Macy, a biophysicist, who used a series of chemicals to treat membranes. And what he discovered is that mercuric chloride was a potent inhibitor of red cell membrane water transport. And if he treated the membranes with chemical reducing agents, he could restore water transport. He could turn it off. He could turn it on, and he concluded correctly that the difference between all membranes and water permeable membranes, highly water permeable membranes, was the existence of these putative water channels, the pathway across the membrane. But neither Macy nor others could identify the channel. And in science, theories and hypotheses are fine. Hypotheses in particular are fine. But to become accepted, you must have scientific proof, strong evidence identify the molecule itself. And it was our laboratory that by sheer serendipity, sheer serendipity, let me repeat that, we made an observation that led to the identity of the water channel and the Nobel Prize. We were studying the rhesus blood group antigen of red cells. RH antigens are important in maternal fetal incompatibility. We identified a new protein of 28 kilodaltons. And in the purifications, a slightly smaller protein co-purified. We cloned out the complementary DNA. And what we found was a series of fragments of genes in the database. One member of the family, MIP, in lens, very abundant but function unknown. Another member of the family, big brain, in, important in brain development in insects, Prosophila melanogaster, but again, biophysical function unknown. A protein that allowed bacteria such as Escherichia coli to use glycerol as a carbon source, but the actual biophysical function unknown. And finally, a series of fragments from the roots of plants. So we identified a new protein. We actually had a putative structure we had everything but a molecular function. And of course, this is the most important, most important feature of any protein is what is its molecular function. We were stuck. So how does one make progress when you're stuck? Well, if you're a student, you can talk to your professor. He or she may know. But you could go to the library. The library has a lot of information. It's the conversations with other scientists that oftentimes leads to the answer. And these conversations occur when we least expect important insight. Let me illustrate. So my wife and, my, and I have four children. These are the center of our lives. They were small, cute little children when this picture was taken 20 years ago. Now they're grown, they're young adults. As a scientist with a modest salary, Every year, our family vacation was in a tent at the great American National Parks. We camped in the Grand Canyon, 
Yellowstone, Yosemite. And after doing these camping trips several years, Mary said, let's be like a democracy, let's vote. Let's ask the children which national park they wish to camp in next year. And they immediately said, Disney World. Well, Disney World is actually not a national park. But we compromised, we went to the Everglades, we went to Disney World. And on our way back from that trip, we stopped at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I spoke with some colleagues. In one of those conversations, when I talked about this new protein in red cell membranes, we knew at that point it's also present in renal tubules, but we didn't have a function. It was a colleague, John Parker, who said, Peter, these are water permeable tissues. Have you considered this is the long sought water channel that biophysicists have been searching for for a century? Never occurred to me, but that idea, John's idea, caused us to collaborate with Bill Gagino in the physiology department at Johns Hopkins. We did a number of very simple experiments. So these two spherical objects here are the eggs of Xenopus labus frogs, frog oocytes, about a millimeter in diameter. On the left is a control oocyte injected with buffer alone, and on the right is an oocyte injected with complementary RNA for this new protein. RNA leads to synthesis of the protein. If this new protein is a water channel, the one on the right should be osmotically active. We already knew that frog eggs were very, very low water conductivity, so we expected the one on the left not to be osmotically active. So we transferred them from isotonic culture media to distilled water. Kapow! Immediate difference. As you can see, the control oocyte is swollen negligibly, the test oocyte is swollen rapidly and exploded, producing immediate jubilation in the laboratory. Let, let me be very blunt. If you're a scientist and you make a discovery, and this is not intensely pleasurable, overwhelmingly joyful, you're in the wrong business. This was Greg Preston, the postdoc, who did these early studies. I took the photograph two years after the discovery. He was still celebrating. <laughs> so suddenly the problem of rapid osmosis, transmembrane water permeability, became clear. It was a new protein which we named aquaporin, now known as aquaporin-1, first molecular water channel, basically the plumbing system of the cells. Now being a small lab, really we were a very small lab, we were not a rich lab, we had a small number of grants. We needed to team up with others. And this is where science is such a rich community. We were able to team up with a number of experts from around the world, I'll show you some of their pictures, to do a number of important steps which we could not ourselves do. First, we teamed up with these two gentlemen, Yoshinori Fujiyoshi from Kyoto, Japan, and Andreas Engel from Biocentrum, at the University of Basel in Switzerland. They're experts in the technique of membrane crystallography. And in short, we solved this structure. If you look on the left panel, from above the cell, the water channel is a narrow pore through the protein, three angstroms in diameter. And I think many of the students will realize the average diameter of a water molecule, 2.8 angstroms, is just big enough. And viewed in cross-section on the right, we have a single channel connecting the outer surface of the cell with the inner surface of the cell, a single aqueous pore, allowing water to move with almost no resistance. And there are barriers to the movement of other solutes. For example, protons, the hydronium ion. They're positively charged domains which repel it. So here we have water in bulk solution, free exchange of protons. Here, water in bulk solution, but this narrow pore, 20 angstroms in diameter, single file movement of water and water alone. And this was work of David Cosano, a talented student in the laboratory who's now a faculty member at Harvard University. So if you look at the space filling model of water at the center of the pore, you'll see it's surrounded by special residues. Arginine, a positive charge. Histidine, a partial positive charge, repelling proton movement. Cysteine, the mercury inhibitory site. Notice, it's big enough for water, just big enough. Now, the work of others has extended this structure, and I'll talk about the other homologs in a moment. 
We were also interested in the physiology of the water channels, as Dean Kockert mentioned. In order to establish the physiology, we had to know where specifically at a cellular and subcellular, subcellular level where the protein was expressed. And we achieved this by teaming up with Soren Nielsen from the University of Aarhus in Denmark, who localized the aquaporin 1 protein in the kidney in the proximal nephron. So shaded in green, here's the glomerulus where filtration occurs, proximal nephron descending thin limb of the loop of Henle. And each of our kidneys has about a million nephron units. And the green highlights the location in the proximal nephron where aquaporin 1 is present. So it's present here, and this is where constitutively high water permeability exists. It's not present in the ascending limb, negligible water transport, and it's not present in the collecting ducts where regulated water transport was known to occur. Surprising, collecting ducts didn't have it. It was a clear prediction that other homologs must exist in kidney. So two microscopic slides. Shown here is a light microscopic preparation of a rat kidney. And what you should see is the tubule here, the lumen where the primary urine flows is surrounded by an apical membrane intensely staining with an antibody for aquaporin 1, present also in the lateral membranes separating the cells in the basal membranes, and not present in the collecting duct. Now, if you look by immunogold electron microscopy at this apical bush, bush border here, you see infoldings of membrane. I think you can see that. It looks like hair-like projections, and the black dots represent immunogold, nanogold particles attached to an antibody to aquaporin 1. So the protein is all present at the absorptive surface, not inside the cell, ideally poised for maximum absorption into the epithelium. So how does this allow water transport to occur? The physiologists here will be aware that every day our kidneys will filter about 200 liters of plasma, filtering the same plasma again and again. 200 liters of filtrate is then passing through the convoluted tubules where 99% of the water is reabsorbed. Imagine if you made 99 liters of urine, well, you would last only a few minutes because you would go into shock. So we must efficiently filter and reabsorb the water. But we must reabsorb the water, but not the acid or waste substances. And the explanation is the distribution of the aquaporin 1. The primary urine flows through the lumen, enters through the apical surface. Tight junctions prevent water from slipping between the cells, exits through the basal membrane. Transcellular movement, almost 200 liters of water per day. It's amazing. Now, as a medical doctor, I'm very interested in the causes of disease. It's our hope that our scientific work will provide something useful to prevent or treat disease, at least lead to the understanding of disease states. And before the human chromosome, human genome is solved, we localized the chromosome for aquaporin 1 in the short arm of human chromosome 7, where we had a candidate locus, the Colton blood group antigens. And this is work of Chilso Moon, graduate student in the lab. And in short, a long series of experiments, we confirmed that the Colton blood group antigen was a polymorphism in the outer surface of the aquaporin 1 protein. But we were made aware that in the whole world, only a small number of humans had ever been identified lacking the Colton antigens. Well, obviously, we were very interested in these Colton null people. And because of the wonderful collaboration amongst blood group referencing laboratories, particularly the National Center in Bristol, England, we gained access to a number of Colton null individuals and confirmed that they had mutations in the gene encoding aquaporin 1. Our thought was, well, this is prote protein must be so important that they'll be severely dis disabled. In fact, the aquaporin 1 null individuals all felt well and looked well. They, they didn't feel sick at all. Here's a photograph of one. With her permission, we took a picture of a lady from south of France, who's a Colton 1, one null individual, an aquaporin 1 null homozygote, with two of our colleagues from Johns Hopkins. She looks well and feels well. And most of the time, all of us look well and feel well. But when we're stressed, certain mutations become very clearly manifest. 
For example, I suffer from a mild form of asthma. If I'm around the laboratory animals, I wheeze. But by using a corticosteroid inhaler and staying away from the lab animals, I'm fine. Others may be sensitive to salt in the diet. Too much salt, they become hypertensive. So silent carrier states are very common. When stressed, we expect this will be a significant phenotype. And Landon King, the young man shown here, did a complete renal tubule analysis of these people and found that they had normal renal function except when thirsted. Every night, if we're lucky, we sleep seven or eight hours. We drink no fluid. In the morning, we wake and we've been thirsted seven or eight hours. And our morning urine, of course, is the entire nighttime's collection. But the next few drops of urine are highly concentrated. So normal individuals will concentrate the urine from physiologic tonicity, 280 milliosmolar, up to about 1,000 milliosmolar after overnight thirsting. The aquapor null, one null individuals can concentrate a little bit, enough to get through the night. But they would surely get into clinical trouble with dehydration long before any of us would. So it's a pretty important phenotype. Landon, also an outstanding physiologist with interest in lung, demonstrated the presence of the aquapor in one protein in the capillaries of lung, and here's a human capillary. You should see the immunogold decoration at both the top and the bottom, both surfaces. And in a collaboration at Johns Hopkins, he did some physiological testing of water permeability in lung. Basically, images were taken of the deep lung structures using a high-resolution CT methodology developed at Johns Hopkins about 30 years ago by a young scientist who came to Johns Hopkins from Algeria. His name is Elias Serhouni. He became the director of the National Institutes of Health and now is the vice president for research of Sanofi in France. So young scientists make discoveries which are important. And using this Serhouni technique, we studied the structures. And so this is a bronchiole in lung. And notice the thin wall. And here's an adjacent venial. Here are the same structures from the normal individual after infusion of three liters of physiological saline. What you should see is that the venial has become engorged, and that's found in all normal and aquapore null individuals. But the release of fluid from the venial to the surrounding space around the bronchial, notice the thickness has increased dramatically. Found in all normal individuals, not found in the aquapore one null individuals, indicate there's a delay and fluid release from the vasculature and blo uh, the blood vessels in lung, which we think may be of large physiological importance at the time of birth when we reabsorb massive quantities of amniotic fluid. So by homology cloning, our laboratory and several other laboratories jumped in and cloned out now hundreds of different aquaporins. Basically, every life form has at least one, if not multiple, aquaporins. And shown in this disease, this gene pileup, are the two subsets of the aquaporins from the mammalian, or from the human repertoire. At the top, shaded in blue, are those which we call classic aquaporin water channels. And yellow at the bottom are those which are permeated by water plus glycerol, which we term aquaglyceroporins, closely related but not identical. And here's AQP1, our original discovery. And I'll talk about a few of these others just to illustrate the diversity of expression, physiological function, and what we believe to be their pathological significance. So in my talk about the proximal nephron, I mentioned the collecting duct does not have aquaporin 1, a prediction which produced sort of a foot race among scientists to clone the homolog from collecting duct. The vasopressin regulated water channel of collecting duct is known to exist in the collecting ducts. And obviously, I'm interested in this. And the answer is that a homolog known as aquaporin 2, similar but not identical to aquaporin 1, a separate gene, is present in renal principal cells in submembranous vacu vacuoles, vesicles in the basal state, but it trans is transported to the cell surface by vasopressin. So vasopressin, I won't go through the biology here, but it works through a receptor, leads to a phosphorylation and exocytosis, so water permeability occurs. But look, the lateral membrane is 
did not contain aquaporin 2, it contains aquaporin 3 or aquaporin 4, so it's, it's in concert that these work together. Now, clinically, these are very important. Long before modern physiology, primitive tribal people recognized that drinking large flu volumes of fluid led to increased urine output, thirsting caused decreased urine flow. The Plains Indians in North America could wage war parties in the middle of the night by warriors drinking large volumes of fluid at sundown. They'd get up in three hours, two hours to void their urine. So defects in the aquaporin 2, in fact, turn out to have significant, very significant clinical consequences. Children with mutation have been identified by our colleagues in the Netherlands. And these children have severe nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. They must drink 20 liters, basically 40 bottles the size of water each day to avoid dehydration. Acquired defects are very common. And they're found in two, co two sorts of situations. Ind individuals that have excess fluid retention, such as congestive heart failure, overexpress the AQP2 protein. And those who cannot concentrate have a deficiency of the AQP2 protein, including the bedwetting of small children. They outgrow it, but they don't make enough aquaporin 2. I'm going to skip rapidly through now other members of the family. I'll mention AQP0. This has another name. It was the MIP protein of lens. So we call it zero because it was known as a polypeptide, but the function was not known. And we now know through the work of Masato Yasui, shown here, that it's important in the biology of lens, and mutations cause cataracts in small children. So there's going to be a theme emerging. Each new member of the family, depending on where it's expressed, has a different kind of biology. AQP4 present in the astroglial end feed and brain. <coughs> now our brains are very special because there's no internal structure. They reside within our crania. The crania are rigid, protective, but this protective rigidity is a problem if there's a brain injury sustained either through trauma, a stroke, because when part of the brain is damaged, it swells, compresses adjacent brain tissue. The AQP4 protein is localized at the ends of these astroglial end feet. They look like suction cups surrounding the surface of the brain capillary. And you can see by immunogold it's present at this membrane, but not this membrane. Very interesting distribution. Now that distribution predicted correctly that this protein must play a role in the manifestations of brain edema. Brain edema is oftentimes the great cause of morbidity following a stroke or head trauma. It's the swelling, not the initial injury, that causes the big damage. And a series of studies undertaken with our colleagues in Norway, led by Mahmoud Amiri Mahadem. I should mention, Mahmoud started his scientific career as a refugee in a camp in Pakistan, adopted by the Norwegian Social Services. He's now a leading neuroscientist. He discovered that mutations in the expression of aquaporin-4 or the localization of aquaporin-4 are beneficial during defined brain injury. If you look here, the normal mouse has a larger amount of edema and infarct after brain injury than the mutant mouse. Now, the mutant mouse suffers from epilepsy, so it's not preferred to be aquaporin-4 null. On the other hand, if we could manipulate the expression of aquaporin-4, Following brain injury, we may have a method for prevention or treatment of brain edema, which would be a very important advance. Stroke is the third leading cause of death in Europe and the United States. Most of the morbidity and the mortality is due to brain edema. So another member of the family, AQP5, is expressed in secretory glands at the apical surface, just this center part of the gland. So here's a gland from a rat. Here's the AQP5 surface. This is the last membrane water crosses during the secretion of tears, sweat, and saliva. Now, a study undertaken our, with colleagues from Denmark, we looked at an aquaporin-5 null mouse created by Anil Menon and Carissa Crane at the University of Cincinnati. And the mouse looks and feels pretty normal. 
It has normal appearing sweat glands in its skin, but by a special technique we're able to identify functional sweat glands because of the release of amylase. It turns starch, alters starch and allows it to react with iodine. So the blue dots represent functional sweat glands. And what you should see is that after pilocarpine injection, a normal mouse has many, many dozens of functional sweat glands. The null mouse has a few weakly functioning sweat glands. Now mice live in cool nocturnal environments. They seek the shade during the hot, hour, hot hours of the day, but humans are out laboring in the sun. For us to sweat is oftentimes a matter of life or death. In 2003, Western Europe, I'm sure Russia as well, sustained the worst heat wave, the longest and most severe heat wave in recorded history. Paris recorded 40 degrees Celsius and above for two weeks consecutively. And the public health officials registered 15,000 unexpected deaths. In Italy, the same thing, 20,000 unexpected deaths. Unexpected because these were older individuals, individuals in their 60s and 70s. But when you get to be 64, as I am, that doesn't seem so old. What does this mean? Is there an aquaporin involvement? And the answer is still unsure, but most likely this does represent the age-dependent decline in physiological function of the aquaporins. Many physiological pathways decline as we age. At age 64, I love to exercise, but I can't run as fast as when I was 18. My heart won't beat as fast. I can't move oxygen as fast. So there are a number of pathways that decline in efficiency. And it's our thought that the decline of the aquaporins in renal concentration, sensation of thirst, and sweat may have contributed to the demise of these individuals. We'll have to wait to, refer, to confirm that that may be true. Now I'm going to sh shift talk briefly about the aqua glyceroporins, the glycerol transporting homologs of the family. And this slide I borrowed from Bing Yap from the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories juxtaposes the pore lining residues, the narrowest part of the channel of an aquaporin, which are shaded in darker colors, and an aqua glyceroporin, which are lightly shaded. And what you should see is, so here's the aqueous pore, here's an arginine, conserved in the water channel and the glycerol transporter. Here's the cysteine, the mercury inhibitory site that Bob Macy identified. Notice it's replaced in the glycerol channel by a phenylalanine, a hydrophobic bulky residue extending out into the pore. Here's a histidine, a partially positive charge from a water channel, and it's replaced by a glycine, a tiny residue here. So it's been resolved with great certainty by molecular dynamics simulations undertaken by Klaus Schulten and his team in Illinois, Helmut Gruppmiller and his team in Germany, that there's motion for glycerol transport. If you imagine this phenylalanine as a hydrophobic trapdoor suddenly springing open, notice the glycine, glycine is very small. The pore is much larger, allowing the permeation by the three carbon polyol. So science makes sense, it's, it's amazing. What does glycerol transport have to do with normal health or disease? Johan Ogren from the University of Uppsala spent a year with us as a sabbatical worker, made this very nice preparation which shows immunostaining of aquaporin, aquaglyceroporin 3 in rodent skin. Here we have prenatal mouse, and the basal levels are intensely stained. And here's an adult mouse. Again, the basal levels skin is intensely stained. This appears to be the glycerol permeated part of the skin, which is essential for skin integrity. Now, it didn't take long for the beauty industry to get interested in this. It was a few summers back, I was visited by some executives from the Christian Dior company. And I don't know about your laboratories here at Moscow State University, but I don't get many visitors from Christian Dior. And they didn't waste their time coming to Baltimore just to say hello. They invited me to Paris to give a, a lecture, a very nice lecture, almost as nice as this. And of course, they had a commercial idea. 
their chemists had identified in a small naturally occurring substance which leads to an upregulation and increase in the aquaglycerin expression in skin, particularly sun exposed skin, which they were offering as a beauty product. Now, I should point out, I have no commercial ties to Christian Dior. Some days I would love to have commercial ties to Christian Dior, but none were offered under terms I could accept. But the notion is, if you use their product, this hydraction skin cream, it costs a lot, 50 euros for a 50 gram jar. If you use enough of this, you'll look like this. I, I'm not convinced personally, but the beauty industry doesn't have to show proof of concept. Now this was the back page of the Marie Claire Beauty magazine, which I purloined from the Charles de Gaulle Business Lounge. And for those of you who can read French, look carefully, it talks about profound hydration, spectacular results, and what's this, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. <laughs> I, I, I showed this to my mother. She's not a university graduate, she's a farm girl, now in her 80s. I showed this to her, she lives back in Minnesota, and she smiled and she said, Peter, I think you're finally doing something useful. <laughs> well, our mothers know us better than we know ourselves. And in fact, it is an important issue to do something useful. And that's our ob object. It turns out that aquaglyceroporin 3 is also present in red blood cells, conferring glycerol transport, which turns out to be very important during the clinical manifestations of malaria. And I now work as a director of a malaria research institute. I spent a third of my year in sub-Saharan Africa. Malaria is my major focus. And you think for a moment, the parasite during the red cell phase will live in a vacuole within a cell, will suddenly grow and divide to 32 daughter cells. How does it synthesize the glycerol lipids without the biochemical machinery? And the answer is glycerol is transported across the plasma membrane, the vacuolar membrane, the parasite's membrane through aquaglycerolporins. And in a series of knockout experiments, we confirmed that the glycerol transport is diminished and the virulence of the infection is diminished. First, let me show you a picture of some real blood. So here's what I'm talking about. An individual parasite in a ring stage will grow and divide to 32 daughter cells, eating all of the hemoglobin of the cell for fuel. And when this cell breaks, releasing 32 daughter cells, the cycle begins again. Two more days, 32 times 32 is 1,000 times 32 times 32 is a million. So in six cycles, we have a billion parasites release, releasing toxic waste leading to horrific fevers and end organ damage. So the knockouts, as I mentioned, will diminish the infection, will prolong survival, but they don't cure the disease. So here are normal mice infected with a wild type malaria parasite. Three weeks, they're all dead. The mutants live longer. Four weeks, they're all dead. So it looks better, but not enough to be a drug target. I'm sorry, but that's research. You ask a question, you assess the situation as well and honestly as you can, and you either move on or move out. But malaria remains a major killer. Malaria was present throughout Europe. At the end of World War I, there was a major malaria outbreak in Arkhangelsk, Russia. Refugees from the south brought the parasites with. No one is totally protected in any environment against malaria. The Anopheles mosquitoes are almost ubiquitous. And in sub-Saharan Africa, this remains a major killer, particularly of the small children, youngsters like these little boys. Aren't they cute, adorable little fellows? Now, they live outside of our field station in southern Zambia. And I, I don't know whether they've had malaria or not, but they're being protected against developing malaria. And if they should develop malaria, they'll be treated aggressively. But shown here is a youngster brought in from further into the rural district, comatose, near death, with cerebral malaria. If you remember a few slides back, I talked about brain edema. Well, one of the manifestations of malaria is cerebral malaria, where it's a combination of brain swelling and infarct that causes brain damage. Now, the good news is the child's life was saved by Philip Tuma, a Johns Hopkins trained pediatrician who's devoted his entire professional career to working in sub-Saharan Africa at malaria hospitals 
particularly that hospital in southern Zambia. So the child's life was saved, but notice he has a disconjugate gaze. He, he's gazing upward because he's sightless. The brain damage of the neural visual cortex because of the malaria infection has rendered him permanently blind for life. And if you think being blinded, hearing deficient, learning impaired, epileptic is a problem in Western, Western civilization, imagine being impaired in a third world community. So there's still much work to be done. Drug resistance has made the existing medicines less effective and the danger is within a decade we're going to run out of medicines and malaria will reverberate through the developed world. Presently, we're down to under a million deaths, but it could easily skyrocket. A million deaths is too many. I and mean, you consider that maybe tens of millions of children are left blind, epileptic. It's still a big problem. Now, I talked about the aquaporin 4 in brain. This is just an experimental slide of a mouse brain showing what happens during cerebral malaria. And the aquaporin 4 is normally present at the perivascular astroglial end foot. So here's a capillary in brain. And these black dots represent the presence of aquaporin 4 normally. In the presence of cerebral malaria, notice this swelling, this blister like accumulation of fluid. That's what kills the kids. Can we prevent it? No. But if we could prevent malaria, we would prevent cerebral malaria. Now, this beautiful bridge represents the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia, where we're working in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I show that not because it's an architectural wonder over the Zambezi River, but to point out that control in one region does not guarantee that it'll be permanent, because if adjacent geographic regions don't treat malaria aggressively to eliminate it, it comes right back. The mosquitoes that carry this don't have passports. They cross the border freely. And mosquitoes also have a series of aquaporins which move fluid rapidly. You may not think about this much, but when a female mosquito bites us to take out blood as a, the blood meal for egg development, it's actually rapidly trans, releasing transudate through the malpighian tubules. Aquaporins are involved to lighten its weight to fly off again. So we're presently working on Anopheles mosquitoes aquaporins not confident that we'll find something of practical utility, but the basic biology could be useful. Now I'm going to turn back to the other aquaglycerporins briefly as I close, because they play important roles as well. Particularly aquaglycerporin 7 and aquaglycerporin 9. 7 is present in adipose tissue, and I think we're all aware in Western societies of the new epidemic of obesity. In the United States right now, two-thirds of the adults are overweight, one-third are obese. Through evolution, we've developed great efficiency for storing calories because our progenitors and previous generations were threatened with starvation every winter. The individuals who could store extra calories had a survival advantage. In the aquaglycerin 7, is the mechanism for release of glycerol from fat during fasting or starving, glycerol being the preferred gluconeogenic substrate, where it's taken up by the liver and they press through aquaglycerporin 9, which, which is expressed heavily during fasting, to convert glycerol back to glucose. Marathon runners are keenly aware of this, this bonking phenomenon that occurs after about two hours is when we change from burning glycogen to burning fat. Humans have been identified with mutations in this, look normal, feel normal, but they can't release glycerol from fat. They'll never win marathons. That's not so important in modern life, but believe me, in previous centuries, it was important for survival. Another surprising function, and, that's, and this is work of Jen Carberry, who's now a faculty member at Duke. Science is always so surprising when someone does something a little kooky and finds something unexpected. It was Barry Rosen from Wayne State University of Michigan who found that aquaglycerporins are freely permeated by arsenite, arsenic trioxide, uncharged at neutral pH. Of course, the arsenic trioxide must chemically resemble the glycerol molecule, 3-carbon polyol. What does this mean? 
And is it important? And the answer is it's quite important because arsenic toxicity is still a major issue in parts of the world, notably eastern India and Bangladesh. In those parts of the world, the surface the water is contaminated by Vibrio cholera, so tube wells have been put in two or three meters down to draw the groundwater. And the groundwater has high natural stores of arsenic trioxide. An epidemic of arsenic toxicity is now being experienced in that part of the world. The World Health Organization predicts 140 million people are drinking arsenic toxic water every day. In a series of studies, of knockout studies with Soren Nielsen, we've confirmed, in fact, the aquaglycerin-4-9 is present in the liver. Here's the null. Here's the specific saying of the wild nut mouse. And when they're injected with arsenic, radioactive arsenic, the normal wild-type mice can excrete the arsenic from peritoneum through the liver into the feces. The nulls cannot, and the nulls succumb earlier. So maybe that's the real explanation for why we have aquaglycerporin 9 in the liver. Another explanation, I should say, so that we can detoxify arsenic. And yes, plants have numerous aquaporins. This is a slide I borrowed from Ralph Kaldenhoff from the University of Würzburg in Germany, showing the presence of aquaporin null state in the Arabidopsis, a small mustard plant. In fact, there's, I think, 35 different aquaporin genes in the Arabidopsis. Normally, this plant can maintain normal stem turgor and foliage with a thin arborization of rootlets. But the engineered strain, which underexpresses the PIP1B aquaporin family, reduces it by, by downregulating the expression of the PIP1B to 20% of the wild type level. The plant now faces an inability to take in enough water. And it compensates by sending out more rootlets. Very simple. When the rains stop, the wildlife migrate to the next water hole. The plants stay behind. Those plants that can compete for water survive. Those that cannot compete don't survive. There may be some significant potential. And of course, these are already ongoing in a number of wild type plants. So by, in closing, I'd just like to skip quickly through the, the, the talk. I talked about the free permeation of water through aquaporins, the substrate variations in some specific members of the family, the structural models, and some, just some of the disease states where we believe these are featured. Now, identifying their presence in a disease state is only the very beginning of the battle. The development of medicines to manipulate this information to either upregulate, mislocalize, or antagonize the water channels are therapeutically, potentially of therapeutic interest, maybe of great value. But to achieve this work, we need young scientists, scientists like yourselves. So I'm kind of issuing a call out here. I think we've done some easy work, it's been interesting, but the hard work, the important work, lies ahead. So returning to the topic of the Nobel Prize, I'd just like to share a little bit of the event with you. This is the morning almost 10 years ago when I got a call early in the morning. Because of the time difference, it was, I think, 5.30 in the morning, the phone rang. And, and yes, there were some clues that the Nobel Committee was interested, but nothing, nothing very convincing. So the phone rings at 5.30 in the morning, pleasant Swedish voice. This is an important telephone call from Stockholm for Professor Peter Agri. Are you Professor Agri? And I replied, why, yes, I am. And they went on to inform me that I would share the Nobel Prize in chemistry with Roderick McKinnon, who I knew, a, a medical doctor like myself doing work on structures of potassium channels. So they went on to explain what would happen and said, now we're going to hang up in 10 minutes. There'll be a press conference in Stockholm. You should get ready for your day. So I sprinted for the shower. My wife, Mary, wiser, organized, calm, called my mother back in Minnesota, awakened her early in the morning. She could tell her the news. Your son, Peter, will share the Nobel Prize in chemistry. My father, who was a chemist, had died eight years earlier. Mother thought for a moment, and she said, Mary, tell Peter that's very nice, but don't let this go to his head. I think she was indicating he still needs to do something useful. I think that's an important message. But by the time I got to the laboratory about 10.30 in the morning, 
the news had gone to the heads of the young people. They, they were on their third bottle of champagne already. And the university president came over to see me. I had no idea till that moment what close personal friends we were. It's funny what a Nobel Prize will do. And shown here are the faces of the young people in the laboratory. And that morning, we had people from eight different countries in our laboratory. And this is one of the great joys to be able to share an event like this with the young people who come from around the world to work in scientific laboratories. We bring, make friendships which last the rest of our lives together and have a second important delivery on the investment of science. The recognition of the Nobel Prize sometimes goes in direction which you can't predict or maybe not even sure you want. As I drove home that evening, this was the marquee in front of the cut-rate liquor store. Usually that's where advertising the price of beer, but congrats, Dr. Agri. I'd just like to defend my reputation that the, the implication that I was this liquor store's best customer is a great exaggeration. And here we are on the stage after the Nobel ceremonies in Stockholm. So there are two prizes in this picture. You can see the medal I'm holding, the Nobel Prize. And I have to point out any resemblance I had to Alfred Nobel. We're not relatives. It ended when I shaved off my mustache. And I think the value of the Nobel Prize is primarily that it highlights the importance of science to the entire world community. Those mornings in October, the radio in the United States and throughout Europe and probably much of Asia announces the awarding of the Nobel Prizes, the announcement of the awarding of the Nobel Prizes. And the prizes are selected for individuals working on topics that are very focused. But in fact, the reward is much greater than that. It goes to the entire field of people working in that area. And there are other fields that probably were narrowly excluded, may get it in a future year. So I think it's a great PR event for what we do. And the second prize in this is the people standing around me, my wife Mary. We've been together now 40 years ago this month we met, with four children. They've always been there to encourage me through every step of my career, through the hard parts, through the fun parts, to keep going, and I'm sure we all have that. So you young people in science, take care of the relationships. They'll support you through good times and bad. And eventually, as you look back on your career, as I do now, you consider all the hard parts and all the good parts, and believe me, it's the good parts that overwhelm the other parts. I challenge you to stick with science. It's a gateway to the future. You never know. You may do your most important work next week. It may change the world. You have that potential. If you give it up and do something else, we understand. Everybody can't be a scientist, but for those of you who have chosen careers in science, I wish you all the best. I hope you have as much fun in your careers as I've had. It's been wonderful. Spasiba. Thank you, Professor Egre, for a very, very interesting story. Uh, paper is open for discussion. Somebody has question, comments, please. In the beginning of the lecture, you said something about your family. Can you please tell us how uh, uh, did your family help you in your research? So the question I think we all heard, how did the family help me with my research? Yes. Well, first off, I think they kept, they, they, they kept things focused. When you have small children who are hungry, they could care less about their father's great, brilliant scientific career. I think children have a way of cutting through all of the pomp and arrogance that scientists sometimes have. Plus, they made it fun. They all came to the lab. They all knew what I was working on. I have to point out that our four children have gone in different directions. None of them are laboratory scientists, but they're each following their passion. Uh, I think their emotional support, their friendship, and we're still very close, was really a, a major factor in staying with the work as long as I did. 
And I, I think this is not rare. I think other scientists will say the same thing. The support of our family, our friends, but in particular our, our family, are irreplaceable in terms of having the confidence to go forward. So I, I can't tell you one specific event, but, well, actually I can. One of our children introduced me to her, her classmate when she was six years old at an ice cream social. And she points to the child's father and says, that's Gracie's dad. Well, Gracie's dad was Stephen McKnight, a well-known molecular biologist who I, who I met. Because of my child, I worked in his lab doing a sabbatical. I learned how to do, clone DNA and clone the aquaporin one. So even suggestions for the work sometimes can come from family members. Did, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe, can I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, this question would be uh, a bit more scientific. Uh, you have said that aquaporins are present uh, throughout the nature. So uh, it may be so that, uh, the, for example, the bacteria uh, also have such proteins. Can we somehow use our knowledge about the aquaporins to fight some bacterial diseases? So the question is about, are aquaporins a target for antibacterial therapy? Yes. And of course, this is the notion that we had with the glycerol transport in malaria. So far, the indications are that they're probably not good drug targets. The diffusion of water seems to be enough for the bacteria to survive, but maybe we didn't do the experiments correctly. Maybe they have potential that we have not identified, but to this date, I think the notion that they may be good antibacterials is, has not been demonstrated. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Скажите, пожалуйста, есть ли сегодня уже лекарства, которые используют как мишень аквапарин? Uh, she asked whether yes. there is targeting of aquaporin. Sure. Are there drugs that use the aquaporins as a target? Well, the naturally occurring neuropeptide, vasopressin, uses aquaporin too to traffic to the cell surface. There are not yet medications that inhibit aquaporin too, but people are looking for this to pre to uh, in, inhibit them in certain clinical states. So I think right now there are no medicines on the market. But there are clearly examples where known pathways in physiology are now understood. So if there are any pediatricians here, they'll be aware that when a premature infant is born, after seven, eight months of gestation instead of the full nine months, one of the major toxicities is immature lung. The inability to remove fluids from the alveolar space. And it was Landon King, whose picture I showed you, showed in a rat model that glucocorticoids, cortisol, leads to a massive upregulation and expression of aquaporin 1 in the pulmonary microvasculature, thereby explaining why premature infants born to mothers who are treated with corticosteroids do so much better. So it, it, it is a, an action. It was understood before, or it was recognized before, but it was not understood. We're, we're still we still don't have any anti-aquaporin agents available. Mercuric chloride is not a, a, a practical way of treating fluid retention. from medical uh, newspaper whether you have your impression about Russian medicine? Well, I think we have a mu much in the, in the United States to acknowledge and thank Russian medicine for producing. I mean, it's one of the very first Nobel Prizes was to Pavlov, the first neuroscientific breakthrough, conditioning. So I think we, we share a lot of interests. I think discoveries are made in both countries. I fear right now that Russia has faced new problems with its uh, post glasnost era wherein lifespans are declining. And what I'd like to tell you that in the laboratory we'll make breakthroughs that should correct that. It's probably a matter of public health issues, cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, highway safety. 
and other issues that are causing this reduced lifespan, particularly of males in, in Russia. Um, so we're aware of that, we're concerned about that. It, only you can solve that though. But we're clearly interdependent. As Steve points out, AstraZeneca is actively working here in Russia. I think the medicines they, they developed are being used here. The young people who are being trained, educated here at Moscow State University will someday be leading laboratories at universities and in industry. So we're mutually interdependent. What should be done uh, to, to get a Nobel Prize? What should be done to win a Nobel Prize? What should be done to win a Nobel Prize? Sorry, it's the question, what should be done to be awarded the Nobel Prize? Exactly. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just heard it, really. Um, there, there is no formula. I mean, I suppose I've had the privilege of speaking to about 150 Nobel laureates in the, science, in the sciences who are living about the way that they have worked, and tr to try to synthesize from that a recipe for being awarded the prize is impossible. But I think if you had to take just one message, it would be enjoy your work. Often people ask Nobel laureates, how hard do you have to work to get the Nobel Prize? And the laureates often say, you don't have to work at all. You have to play, and you have to play very hard <laughs> at what you enjoy. And then maybe your work will be successful but it's impossible to say. And the decision is not to do with the Nobel Foundation anyway. The decisions for the, about the Nobel Prize are made by the various Nobel Prize awarding committees, and they're not here today, so they would be the people to ask. Thank you for your question. Thank you, and uh, one more question. Uh, do you have any, does the Nobel Committee have any plans uh, for further cooperation with uh, the Moscow State University and also with the company AstraZeneca? Um, well, certainly we, ha we c continue our collaboration, our very successful collaboration with AstraZeneca on this Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative. We um, have already run uh, eight events around the world together, and that, that just continues, and our next event will be in the US in, um, in, in the autumn, and then we have more in the pipeline coming along. And I think the success of today's event shows how valuable this collaboration is. Um, we, we move the collaboration around, and so as yet we have no plans to, be, to work with Moscow State University again, but when you experience such a wonderful day as today, it makes you, of course, want to do more things in the future. Thank you. Я задам вопрос по-английски, потом повторю его по-русски. I'll ask my question in English first, then I'll repeat it in Russian. Uh, Mr. Reger, you've uh, received, despite that it was 10 years ago, but it's forever, you received the most distinguished international uh, prize for achievements of science. Uh, you work uh, with the collective and laboratory uh, pretty much international, as I can judge from, from the picture. Uh, do share the opinion that uh, there is no national science, no Russian science, no American science, no Chinese science, the science that the science is global or not? Well, the issue of national ownership of science, I agree with. Science is public. Once you make a discovery, it's everybody's. And as glorious as it is to have a Nobel Prize, you're quickly forgotten. At lunch, I quizzed the students. I said, quick now, who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2004? No one could remember. 2005. So we've become footnotes. The science lives on, and that's the important issue. And while there's no ownership of science, there are trends. And I think there's no question that Russian science, and physics in particular, has pre been preeminent. My year, 2003, two Russians received Nobel Prizes in physics, Valery Ginsberg, here in Moscow, 
and Alexei Ab Abrakasov, who was working at the University of Illinois. No, he was working at the Argonne Laboratories in Chicago. So two out of nine laureates that year were physics Russian scientists. So I think there's a trend there. I think in the life sciences, the U.S. has had a tremendous advantage. But things change. I think the investment of science is an important issue. And the precious interest of the young scientists is the major determinant of who will succeed in science. If you have young people excited about science and train them, they'll do great science. Thanks. Question about aquaponics. If it's possible, a few words about dynamic. High calf for life, uh, stability, uh, dynamic during the cell cycles, and so on. Is it known something? If it is possible, do some comment. It's an important issue. And when we discovered the aquaporins, there was actually a paper published just before ours by our colleague Daniel Nathans, a wonderful molecular biologist who identified the protein we know to be aquaporin 1 is, is a delayed early response element in cultured fibroblasts. I think you're right. I think the regulation is modulated very rapidly and very carefully. I, I can't tell you specifically which cell type. Red cells, they live 120 days. The aquaporin levels are pretty constant as far as we can tell. But there may well be involvement in cell cycle. I'm sorry, I don't know more than that. Mr. Robbery? Well, just the other day I heard about a successful 3D printed red kidney transplantation. And considering the complexity of such basic functions as water permeation as we've seen today, do you think, well, how do you think it is feasible for human bodily organs in 3D printed models to, for replacements like in the next decade? Sure, so if I understand the question is the idea of trans-species transplantation. Sure. It's not something I know much about, frankly. It would be useful if we could manage the immune rejection to be able to use porcine organs or bovine organs. But the immunological barriers are still way too difficult. But that said, human-to-human -human transplantations be, can be pretty well managed with the current immunosuppressant medicines. So you never know what the future will bring. I can say with confidence it's not been done well yet, but it may be. Probably the last question. Okay, the last question. Mr. Redra, uh, I'm very glad for your visit in Moscow. Uh, welcome to Moscow. Uh, and, uh, Samey, you are a modern, true scientist, true, true modern scientist. And what do you think about God? Uh, are you believe in God or are you atheist? Oh, it's a religious question. I, um, I was raised in the Lutheran Church. Most Scandinavians have a Lutheran affiliation. And I sort of uh, have retained parts, parts of the religious faith, not, not, not the belief in the hereafter, I have no idea. But I think the notion shared by many religious that we should be doing God's work here on earth. Our work should have the benefit of others. And if this is a religious belief, that's great. If it's not a religious belief, that's also fine. So I'm, I'm certainly not an atheist. I don't know enough. How would I know that there is no God? But I, I don't consider myself a, a born-again Christian. I, I respect the religion of, of other people. I, I personally feel that our, our works, our actions, should be how we're judged rather than our statements of faith. That, that's a personal thought. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't mind, OK, please. Uh, you said that uh, Kirkland, uh, can be not in every cell in the organism, but some organisms, like humans, uh, can have and go to any acropolin. So, um, can you explain how it can be? So, one will have acropolin in the organism and some don't. And what are positive or negative factors to have or not to have acropolin? This is a question I'm a little unclear about the importance of the null phenotype, having no acropolin expression. 
Is it, do I have, is that your question? Yeah, I, not sure. only humans, I mean. Okay, so, so the human null phenotypes have been identified for just a few members of the family. I talked about AQP1 null. It's very, very rare, but it doesn't seem to be physiologically so important unless one is fluid deprived. So I, I suspect while it's very rare, if it were harmless, it would not be so rare. So it probably has an important role in fluid absorption during birth. Acoporin-2 mutants I talked about in the lecture, they actually have severe clinical consequences. It's lethal for mouse to have a knockout in Acoporin-2. It's a severe handicap for a human. Acoporin-3 nulls have been identified. They've never been reported, but I can tell you they feel well. I think they probably have dysfunctional skin in terms of uh, uh, humidification barrier skin. No Acoporin-4 null individual has yet been identified. The knockout mice look okay, but they have a beneficial situation when they're sustained brain injury, yet they have increased epileptic seizures. Uh, Acoporin-5 appears to be mislocalized in some forms of Sjogren's syndrome. Acoporin-7, I talked about the glycerol transport is de delayed, but it's not a great cl clinical consequence. So overall, I have to say the acoporins appear to be most important in times of stress, not at times of basal metabolism. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Пожалуйста. Спасибо вам за замечательную лекцию. Это большая честь для нас слушать вас. Скажите, пожалуйста, уважаемый профессор, может ли плохой человек стать хорошим ученым? Спасибо. Good question. Can a bad person become a good scientist? Well, there are many good people who are bad scientists or not scientists. So I think it's not an issue of human quality that determines science. It's inquisitiveness. And yes, personalities differ. There's some very unkind people I know in science who are successful. But I suspect young people have a ch choice of working in a successful lab with a, with a kind mentor or a successful lab with an unkind mentor would prefer the kind mentor. So I think it's an independent quality. I think truth, though, is important. A dishonest person will not be a good scientist because science is about the truth. Making a breakthrough in a prominent journal which is incorrect or horror, horror of horrors, fraud, is self-defeating. So I think good qualities help. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, AstraZeneca is a global uh, innovation-driven pharmaceutical question. So for us, good, uh, good. scientific leadership I, I like is all about yeah. how do we really uh, accelerate, discover, and uh, develop yes, uh, innovative medicines to patients. So we're taking three steps. First, we are focused on uh, the area of uh, research and development on area of science and the disease that we think give us the best chance and advantage, which including cancer, that's the first area. Second area is uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, metabolic disease. The third area is a respiratory inflammation and autoimmune disease. The second approach we're taking is to accelerate and uh, continuously develop our late stage pipeline so we can move those projects to patients faster. And finally, uh, we're also trying to collaborate with scientific community, both in US, in Europe, as well as in other emerging market countries to accelerate uh, finding new ways to uh, develop uh, new molecules and also uh, to identify opportunities to actually uh, discover and develop those molecules together to enrich our pipeline. So hopefully uh, that uh, give you a quick summary of the three steps we're taking to achieve scientific leadership. Thank you. Uh, professor, if I recall right, you have a medical background. Uh, John Hopkins ho uh, Hospital, yes, to bracket. 
so as a young MD, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, would your uh, MD ever uh, help you in your uh, scientific uh, career? And uh, what kind of advice you would give to a, a young uh, medical uh, degrees or medical doctors uh, who want to pursue uh, in the science? Thanks. Sure. So I think the issue of medicine as a background for science is a very good one. I didn't do a PhD, I did an MD. And while I have maybe some limitations in my chemical, biochemical understandings, I can look things up, I can talk to others. But understanding the disease states was a huge advantage when we identified the different members of the aquaporin family, knowing exactly where they're expressed, we could anticipate physiological functions and pathophysiological defects. So I think medicine is a very good background for some forms of life sciences research, but it's not the only background. I think Steve already talked about recruiting young people to the pharmaceutical industry. They need people with lots of different backgrounds. And being a career medical doctor may not be of any preparative value at all for information systems or structural biology. So it, it depends on the area of interest. Okay, one of the last question, if you don't mind. I have a question to Professor Hacker. Uh, Professor, after the winning the Nobel Prize, this uh, prestigious award, uh, what, have you, what goals do you have after this? Uh, what projects do you work uh, between 2003 and uh, until now? And what are you going to do uh, uh, in the future? Sure. Future perspective. Thank, Thank you. you and I'm sure you are a gentleman. We had started working on malaria before the Nobel, and it became possible to focus all my attention on things that I couldn't focus them on before. So the lab side focused entirely on malaria, but I've also gotten an increasing involvement in human rights, science diplomacy. But the lab side, we went into malaria. And the Nobel made that easier. But I have to tell you, I don't think I'm a very successful malaria scientist. We have not made any important discoveries yet. Maybe as administrator for the institute, the institute will make discoveries. So there's no guarantee having a Nobel Prize that you'll do anything worthwhile later in your career. But maybe you can inspire others. Maybe that's the purpose of the event we have today, to encourage young scientists like yourself to go for it. You may make a brilliant discovery that will change the world. I hope you do. Okay, Professor Regra, uh, thank you very, very much for your wonderful lecture. And I would like to thank also organizers of this uh, event. And I'm very impressed with some questions. Thank you all of us for this wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.